This video is about solution formation. By the end of this video, you should be able to explain the steps associated with solution formation, explain the energetics of solution formation, and explain the relationship between solubility and temperature and solubility and pressure. Recall that a solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances in a single physical state. The particles are very small, so you can't see the individual particles, and they're uniformly distributed. Particles will not separate no matter how long you let the solution sit, and no components are large enough to scatter visible light. The properties are uniform throughout. The two phases have been completely and evenly mixed together. Quickly let's review some solution vocabulary. Recall that the solute is a substance that is dissolved. This usually undergoes the change of state from solid to aqueous. For example, NaCl in salt water is the solute. The solvent is the substance that does the dissolving. Again, in salt water, this would be the water. We dissolve the solute into the solvent. A substance that will dissolve in a particular solvent is said to be soluble, while those that will not are insoluble. While we've looked almost exclusively at solutions of solid dissolved in liquids in this class, consider the fact that solutions can be all kinds of different combinations of phases, from gas to gas, as with air, to solid to solid, as with alloys like sterling silver. However, in this class we've focused only on aqueous solutions. An aqueous solution, recall, is a solution with water as the solvent. It can be ionic or covalent. When it's ionic, the ions separate or dissociate upon dissolving. This results in the formation of an electrolyte or a solution that conducts electricity. For example, when NaCl solid is dissolved in water, we get aqueous Na plus ions and Cl minus ions that separate from one another. When covalent substances are dissolved in water, the molecules separate, but they do not break apart. These are non-electrolytes. Since no charged particles are put in solution, they do not conduct electricity. For example, solid sugar dissolved in water results in aqueous sugar, meaning each sugar molecule has separated from its neighbors, but the sugar molecule itself remains intact. Recall also that polar substances like water will dissolve other polar substances, such as ionic compounds, or polar covalent molecules. Here we see a covalent molecule. Note all the sites where hydrogen bonding can occur. When there's many sites for hydrogen bonding, water molecules will easily be able to hydrogen bond with the solute, thus causing the solute to dissolve. Water will not dissolve nonpolar substances, however, such as oil. Note here that there are no sites for hydrogen bonding to occur. Therefore, water molecules will not be able to be attracted to this molecule. The general rule of thumb, though not true in every case, is like dissolves like. Polar substances dissolve polar substances, and nonpolar substances dissolve nonpolar substances. Again, water is a good solvent for polar substances because it's able to surround and attract charge ions or it's able to hydrogen bond with molecules capable of hydrogen bonding, such as the one shown here. Let's consider the process of solution formation. NaCl dissolves because of the attractions between the, sodium, the positive sodium ions and water and the negative chloride ions and water. These attractions are strong enough to overcome the attractions between Na positive and Cl minus. The ions then become surrounded by solvent particles. This process is called solvation. This is the interaction between the solute and the solvent particles. More specifically, we can call it hydration when the solvent is water. This process is shown here. Our positive sodium atom is attracted to and surrounded by the negative ends of water molecules, whereas the negative chloride ion is attracted to and surrounded by the positive ends of the water molecules. Similarly, non-ionic solids like those shown here in black can be hydrated when molecules are capable of hydrogen bonding with water molecules. Here we see two examples. First, ethanol, which contains this OH group. These are two sites where hydrogen bonding can occur. The oxygen can hydrogen bond with a hydrogen from a neighboring water molecule, whereas the hydrogen can form a hydrogen bond with the oxygen of a water molecule. This allows ethanol to be surrounded by water molecules. Dimethyl ether, on the other hand, 
has one site for hydrogen bonding. This oxygen can form a hydrogen bond with the hydrogen end of a water molecule. This allows these molecular solids to have some solubility in water. Let's consider now how a solution forms. I've broken the process he up here into a series of three steps. However, please be aware that these steps generally occur pretty much simultaneously. I've just divided it into three steps to help us simplify the process. First, the solute must be separated into its ind individual components. This is often referred to as the expansion of the solute. Then, intermolecular forces in the solvent must be overcome to make room for the solute. This is often referred to as the expansion of the solvent. Then, the solute and the solvent must interact to form the solution. Here's a diagram representing these three steps. First, the solute is separated or expanded. Then, the solvent is separated or expanded. And finally, the solvent and the solute interact with one another. Now let's consider the energetics of this process. The enthalpy of solution is defined as the enthalpy change associated with the formation of a solution. It will be the sum of the enthalpies of the three steps that we just laid out, and it may be positive or negative. Let's consider this process as shown here. First, the solvent and the solute must be expanded. Each of these are endothermic processes, meaning energy must be put in to make them happen. However, when the solute and the solvent particles interact in the process of hydration, energy is released in an exothermic process. Notice in this case, the exothermic process released more energy than the two endothermic steps, making the overall process exothermic, giving us a negative delta H. On the other hand, in this case, the two endothermic steps required more energy than was released in the exothermic step making this solution formation an endothermic process with a positive delta H. Again, putting that into words, when steps one and two are endothermic steps require more energy than is released by step three, the overall dissolving process will absorb thermal energy and be endothermic. On the other hand, when less energy is required for the endothermic steps one and two than is released by the exothermic step three, the dissolving process will release thermal energy and be exothermic. Now let's consider two main factors affecting solubility. The first is pressure. Pressure affects the amount of gas dissolved in a solution. It turns out that the amount of gas dissolved in a solution is directly proportional to the pressure of the gas above the solution. This is known as Henry's Law. In other words, as pressure increases, gas solubility increases. Here we see a diagram. As the pressure is increased, we see that more gas particles dissolve in solution. If you've ever made seltzer or soda with a soda stream, you've seen this in action. Increasing the pressure causes more gas to dissolve. The other main factor is temperature. The solubility of liquids and solids tends to increase with increasing temperature, as shown in the diagram here. However, the solubility of gases actually decreases with temperature, as shown on the right. This is another phenomenon you may have seen, if you've ever noticed that soda tends to go flat faster in hotter temperatures than in colder temperatures. Since particle size for solvent and solute in solutions is too similar to use filtration, there's two other processes that we can use to separate the solvent from the solute in a solution. These processes exploit the differences in properties caused by different IMFs among the components. First is chromatography. This separates the solvent from the solute based on different strengths of interactions between the components. Column chromatography and paper chromatography are the most common. In each case, the components are separated because they are attracted to different degrees to either the substance in the column or the paper itself. Distillation is another method. This separates species based on a difference in boiling points. Here we see a solution that's being heated and then recondensed. Since the substances in the solution will have different boiling points, one will vaporize and condense at a different temperature than the other. Here we see that the water has a much lower boiling point than the salt in the water. Therefore, the water will evaporate and recondense and collect in this flask, and the salt will remain behind since its boiling point is much higher. 
That brings us to the end of this video. Let's review our goals. First, we learned to explain the steps associated with solution formation. Then we learned to explain the energetics of solution formation. And finally, we looked at the relationship between solubility and temperature and solubility and pressure.